Oh. You're 27? Holy cow. This jacket's 27. <laughs> You're only 27? <laughs> yes, children, please come get your tablets. They're on the ball, these guys. Yeah, our, our youth club is growing. Thank you, Samuel, for that. And let me just add to what Sammy said. If you don't have any friends, come to youth club and make a friend. <laughs> and uh, we'll see that you don't leave friendless. If you want to mark down a really fun date that we've got coming, right? Can I do that? March 13. That is the date of the Winter Jam. At uh, St. Charles Family Arena, there's going to be I don't know, four, five, six bands? Ten. Something ten like that? Ten. Ten bands? Ten. There's ten bands? <laughs> Holy mackerel. There's ten bands, including Skillet from Memphis, Tennessee. Now, I know those guys, so I have a call out to John Cooper to see if our youth group can get five minutes with him or uh, something at least. Uh, and see what he says. Of course, my son David's getting him to go to Westminster, so we'll, we'll, we'll just have to see who wins that fight. But uh, I've known John Cooper since he was uh, 11 years old, so in the Memphis church. So I was there when he was all getting started, Now he's got that big black beard, and uh, he's doing a great work for the Lord in the field that God's put him in. I could never be in that field, but God bless him. That's great. It's pretty loud, Paul. I don't know if you want a ticket or not. I mean, it's pretty loud. Yeah, 10 bands. And they're all at one time. They're all playing at one time. <laughs> so we have finally reached, don't applaud when I say this, but this is the last entry in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't applaud. Make me feel bad. Uh, next week is our last entry in the kingdom of God. I could go on, but we, I'd keep you here to the next millennium. But um, we're wrapping that up next week. And then we're going to do something in the Old Testament. I haven't fully decided yet, so we might do the only Italian prophet in the Old Testament, Malachi. We might do him. It's Malachi. He's not Italian. But I'm considerate because nobody preaches on Malachi. Well, wait, we'll see. I'll let you know next week. But here we are on the Sermon of the Mountain, and let's uh, say our verse of Scripture together, if we could, from 1 Peter. First Peter, there it is, let's say it together. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. But the word of the Lord remains forever. Heavenly Father, as we approach your word, we do so with reverence and awe. With our necks bent forward in obedience to you. Lord, we put away all of our prejudices and all of our druthers, and uh, private interpretations that we like to carry. And we allow the word of God to shape us and to teach us and to mold us and to, and to create in us uh, increased godliness. And so, Lord, we yield ourselves right now to the authority of the word and thank you that it's changing us to be more like Jesus every day. And it's in his name we pray, amen. <clears throat> We've arrived at Matthew chapter 7 just by way of uh, bringing us back now. Uh, Matthew 5, the, the word you're looking for is the word fulfillment there. That sums up chapter 5. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophets. John the baptizer is, John the Baptist is jailed. It's the end of the Old Testament era, and the beginning of the New Covenant, where Jesus is king. The word fulfillment. Matthew 6, the word is father, F-A-T-H-E-R, father. When I'm tired and I slip into my British accent, it's father. I lived in England for two years, and it's a way easier way to talk. Did you hit him back? You didn't get a clean blow in? What happened to you? Naomi skinned her nose, and I'm just seeing it for the first time. I'm sorry. Could you get more red? She gets red. Look at her. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to embarrass you. Jeff, don't hit her anymore. Uh, 
<clears throat> Where are we? Oh, Father. Uh, and Matthew 7, the word that sums up Matthew 7 is the word judgment. The word judgment. And don't cringe when you hear that word. It's not only judging, it's judging with discernment. It's judging with purpose. It's judging with God's glory in mind. Not just uh, scolding everybody because they're smoking cigarettes or whatever they might be doing. Uh, and we learn about judgment. And we're going to sum that up. It's still about judgment all the way to the end of the chapter. And so let's read together Matthew chapter 7 and start at verse 13. So it's right after the golden rule, which we covered last week. And it says in verse 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy. That leads to destruction. And those who enter it by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Notice the contrast of the word many and few. Verse 15, beware of false prophets. I think some translations say teachers. Does your translation say teachers? Anybody? Does it all say prophets? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. <clears throat> every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down <coughs> Excuse me, and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Verse 21, the scariest passage in the entire Bible. I'm about to read the scariest passage, to me anyway, in the entire Bible. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Man, that's harsh. Think about it. 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine <clears throat> and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. So the concept of judgment carries on past the golden rule. And what we have here are four basic warnings. Four basic warnings from Messiah. And let's just pause a minute and realize and remember what we're hearing here is the king of the kingdom outlining the platform for how to live in a broken world as a kingdom citizen. He's teaching his disciples this is who you are now. And he contrasts it with the Gentiles. He contrasts it with the Pharisees. And he, he gives some pretty strong exhortations of how he wants us to live uh, because we, are his, we, are, we have been chosen to be citizens of the kingdom. So let's not forget that we're hearing from a king. We're not hearing from a philosopher or a good teacher. We're hearing from a king who is outlining his, uh, what, what he expects of his kingdom citizens. That's normal. Any ruler would outline uh, what he's going to do and what he expects of you. So there's four things here that he warns us of. Number one, uh, the disciples must choose between two gates and two roads. That's verses 13 and 14. The disciples must choose between two types of prophets, 15 through 20. The disciples must choose between being two kinds of disciples. 21 through 23. And finally, they must choose 
how they're going to build on two foundations, verses 24 through 27. You see, Jesus is, is summing it up here. Not only can you use the word judgment, but the word wisdom is a key word here. He's saying you have to live with wisdom in this broken world. You can't just make guesses or do things by intuition because demons can deceive you. Your own mind can deceive you. you the wickedness that's left in your heart can deceive you. We must live only by the word of God. Well, do whatever's in your heart. That's not good counsel because uh, our, our hearts still uh, like to gravitate toward that which is not kingdom producing. Okay. <clears throat> uh, as I get older, I trust myself less. I rarely, these days, God bless you if you talk this way, it's up to you, but for me personally, I probably never say, if I say it, it would be, the context would have to reveal it, but I, I rarely say, God told me. I don't trust me. It's not that I'm not sure, but I've devoted myself to living by the word of God and having the spirit speak to me through the word only. And I gotta tell you something, I feel a lot safer. I feel a lot safer. When I, after 42 years of seeing all the mess that's been created by intuition, by a fake dream, by a fake prophet, I could tell you stories we'd be here all day long of da damaged and ruined lives as a result of spurious <clears throat> ways of thinking that God contacts us. This is how he contacts us. <clears throat> and this alone. You can have an intuition. That's okay. You can say, God led me. It's okay. But at the same time, I'm using Jesus' warning here to be careful we're in such grave danger today, such grave danger. In, in the early days, all you had was a pastor and a church, and you got all your truth from them. But now, as soon as you turned loose here at, at 11 o'clock, there's millions of voices clamoring for your attention, millions. And you may be plugged into 30 of them. And out of that 30, 29 may contradict what I would say. Possible. And so it's a dangerous time. We've got to be mega discerning and full of wisdom. And, but not condemning. Not condemning all the time. I get a little nervous when men call out names. You know, don't listen to that guy. I don't know that I'm smart enough to make that judgment to be candid. I mean, the Lord will show you for sure. And, and Jesus gives us direction here. So I'm way ahead of myself. <clears throat> there are two questions we should always ask ourselves when we're seeking God for wisdom or for direction. That's not explicit in the Bible. Who should I marry? Where should I live? What kind of job should I have? It doesn't say, you know, and you don't play Bible roulette. <laughs> I'm going to live in Cyprus. What? Okay. <clears throat> when the Bible's not explicit about direction in our lives, we ask ourselves these two questions. What is the wise thing to do? And secondly, what will bring God the most glory? What will bring God the most glory? Leaving that job because you don't like the boss might not be the wisest thing to do. It might not bring God the most glory when you contemplate it. But changing your attitude and having a good attitude toward a sour boss will cause you to be a light in the office or the factory or whatever. Because everybody else has a bad attitude. So those are questions we have to ask ourselves as disciples because the kingdom and its glory is the most important part of our lives. Let's look at these four warnings and break them down. Ready? First of all, the broad road and narrow road comparison, which is verse 13 and 14. Jesus says, <clears throat> Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy. That leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So let's say you're, you're standing in front of two gates, and you peer into the one, and you see like a, like a six-lane highway beyond the bridge. 
And it just goes, it looks like it goes for infinity and there's fields on the side and there's a lot of people on it. And they're all traveling down this road and it looks attractive and it looks easy. And you see, you look over here and you see another gate and it's got only a narrow path. And you can only see maybe 15 feet into it. And you can tell that it takes a turn. You're not sure where it goes. This is going to require faith. This is going to require, you know, uh, taking a chance. Sacrifice, perhaps. I don't know what lies behind there. But I know who the gatekeeper is. And so that's what he's saying here is <clears throat> we look at the broad road and the narrow road, and the first question we ask is this, where do these two roads lead? You don't have to guess, Jesus told us. One leads to destruction, and one leads to life. So right away the decision would be a piece of cake if you're a true king disciple, true kingdom citizen. But still people negotiate, and still people think. Number two, lo lots of people on the broad road, but does that make it the right way? Look at all those people. Look at all those people. Need I remind you that Jim Jones in Guyana killed 1,000 people with Kool-Aid. How do you get people, how do you get, how do you get 60 million people to submit to mask and imprisonment and damaging your children? How does that happen? How do you get humans into boxcars to send them to their death? How did they do that? Do you think they said, we're going to kill you now? They said, oh, we're going to make you safe and we're going to help. It's for health. It's for safety. It's for your safety. It was all lies, wasn't it? And it led to their destruction. The Broadway is tempting because, number one, it's convenient. Shoot, you just open that gate and pfft, you're on the road. No big deal. With everybody else. Isn't this wonderful? Look at all those people. I'm going to say this to you now, okay? A lot of people does not equal... The approval of God. A lot of people does not equal he must be of God. I mean, uh, I had the opportunity when I lived in England to go to a professional soccer game. It was like, uh, it wasn't like the Premier League. I think it was Tottenham Hotspurs <laughs> from London and another team I don't remember. But I'll never forget the experience. 70,000 people crammed into this old stadium. Some people were behind cages. Because this is the 70s and the 80s, and they're, they're, they were rowdies. And they would maybe kill the other players or something. I don't know. But it was like a worship service. They sang hymns. They were swaying. It could have easily have been some kind of crusade. No problem. It was a religious experience. And that's how they treat the game of soccer over there. It's like a religion. And so, no problem getting 70,000 people. You know, people say to me all the time, how many people do you have in Toronto? I say, oh, 40, 50, 60, something like that. You know, lots of kids. Great, we love them. I say, well, what? why don't you have more people? I said, would you like me to get to 1,000? I can. And give me nine months, I'll have a thousand people here. I'm not kidding you. I know how to do it. And I have the personality to do it. But I have to compromise on every single thing I know to do it. So what's my choice? There isn't a choice. <laughs> now, I'm going to believe that some people will begin hungering for the truth so much that we won't be able, you know, I just want disciples. <clears throat> to disciple them in the ways of the Lord. Okay. But don't be fooled by a lot of people. As a matter of fact, if everybody's going for something, I would take a step back and say, now why? Why is everybody going for that? Well, I don't want to be the odd guy. I don't want to be unpopular. All my friends are doing it. You know what? This is the cost of being a disciple of Jesus. You've got to ask these questions. And it's he who is raising the questions, not me. And he's raising them as warnings. Um, it's popular. Uh, the, the Broadway is popular. 
Um, all advertisements on TV, radio, streaming, whatever you do, every single advertisement you ever run into is tempting you and pressing you for the broad way. <coughs> the quick fix. The solution to your life. You drink this type of cola and you're going to have life. You buy this kind of car and girls are going to swoon all over you. You wear this kind of cologne and your life is set. Short term, fast fix, Broadway. And it leads to destruction. And fellas, I tried every cologne out there. None of them work. I think it was British Sterling to got Molly. And that was the cheapest one. Jesus is the only way to eternal life. There are no other choices. Jesus is teaching you that there's only two ways to live, one to destruction and one to life. But, but I want more choices. Actually, there isn't any. There's just categories in two main sections, life and death. And all the path on the broad path lead to destruction. I didn't say it, Jesus did. So you've got to know what, tra- what highway you're traveling on. You see, sinners who love sin and want to sin, they hate what I just said, that Jesus is the exclusive way to eternal life. There are no other choices. Oprah would have a conniption fit if she heard me preaching this. She'd probably attack me on the airwaves or whatever she does. He can't be the only way. It's not fair. He must be the only way. (laughs) He can't be the only way. There's all kinds of paths to God. No, Jesus said there's only two. Rebels hate the exclusivity of Christ. I have the opportunity to meet with pastors here and there still around. Somebody who remembered from the past or a New Covenant guy arranges a a meeting with me and their new pastor or whatever. And you'd be surprised how often the the topic comes back to the table of the Lord when a pastor is sitting with me. I understand you have the table every week. Yeah, that's right. How often do you have it? Well, once a year on a Thursday night. Why? Well, It's not for everybody, and you know? I'm trying to reach everybody. That should be an indicator to you right there. Why do you think Jesus instituted it? To reinforce his words, yeah. <laughs> you're either partake of the meal or you're not. Oh, you can't be exclusive and reach the unchurched. I said, who are the unchurched? You mean the pagans, the unsaved? Who are you talking about? You see, we've changed all the nomenclature now. And uh, I'll stop. Okay. Two types of prophets, 15 through 20. Two types of prophets. Beware of the false prophets. Lots of voices out there. Some are wolves. They look like you. They act like you. They even dress in skinny jeans. (laughs) And shirts that are two sizes too small. I'll never understand that. But they're looking to devour you, not save. They're looking to devour you. Here's the test. It's not hard. You will know them by your fruit, by their fruits. That means you'd have to do some measure of investigation. You can't stand back and just look at the gloss and say, this is wonderful. You've got to do some investigation. How many marriages has the pastor had? What are his kids doing? Have they all disavowed him? Why? You better do some research. There's several mega popular, a couple of them I know. I won't say a name, but there's two people that are very highly popular. Everybody's listening to them. They're on their third marriages. I mean, you would have thought we would have learned from the Tammy Faye's thing, and we didn't. It's glossy, it's popular. Okay, here's the test. By their fruits you will know them. Fruit is not a lot of people. Get, you got to get that out of your head. Fruit is not a lot of people. Listen, the greatest preacher who ever walked the earth, the greatest preacher, his name is Jesus, he ended up with 120 people at the end of his ministry. He told everybody, wait for 10 days, go to this room. There's only 120 people there. Where is everybody? Where's the multitude who witnessed all the miracles? 
Where are they? You wouldn't think it was you. I got to get in that room. How do I get in that room? I'm, I'm going to go three days early and stay in that room. There's only 120 left. By today's standards, Jesus would be a failure. As would Paul. He didn't have enough faith to get out of prison. You see, the kingdom measures human success the opposite way than the world does. Fruit. What is fruit? Fruit is likeness to Christ. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Uh, peace, joy, self-control, all those. That's a short list of what Jesus is like. That's the image bearing. So when you're bearing fruit, you're being like Christ. Character of Christ. Godly lifestyle. Not flashy, but humble. Teaching and example point you to Christ, not the prophet. False teachers, prophets, draw people's eyes away from Jesus Christ to their own gifts and ministries. Look at me. Not look at Jesus, look at me. And here's a short test if you don't have time to investigate. If you're in someone's company, you're listening to a podcast, and you, you don't leave the 30-minute broad, broadcast hungry for Jesus, you're reading your Bible, it's directed you toward the Bible, you're hungry to know more about Jesus, it's not a true ministry of the Lord. It's not a true ministry. Because every true ministry of the Lord creates a hunger in you that can only be satisfied by Christ. And eating, I want more of him. I want to know more about him as a result of this Bible study. If you want to know more about this person's books and tapes or whatever it might be, I would be leery. I would, I would be sideways. I would be saying, oh, hold on. Where is this guy propelling me? Meet me in Toronto this fall and get your other miracle. <laughs> I can't even do the voice. <clears throat> False teachers. Okay, I already said that. Uh, you remember Judas. A little example here. Uh, Judas was a scoundrel, of course. He was not regenerate. Uh, Luke 10, 17. Uh, Christ sent out the 72, and Judas returned rejoicing. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in his name, in your name. He was focused on the phenomenon. He was focused on the flashy and the sparkly. What was Jesus' response? You know, Judas, that will come and go. Don't focus on that. Instead, rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Well, that didn't satisfy him. He wanted more flashy. He wanted more because he, remember, he was the one that groused about Jesus getting anointed. Saying, we could use that money for the poor. What a hypocrite. But my point is, he was attracted by the flashy, the Broadway. And interesting, that's, that's the name of that great place in New York where all the shows are, the Broadway, Broadway. I only thought about that the other day. Number three, there's two kinds of disciples. I, I consider this scary stuff. I only, when I read my Bible and I'm in Matthew, I kind of read over that quickly because it scares me. It's scary. When you think about, oh, here comes so-and-so. Oh, he's done so much for the Lord. And the pronouncement on is, I don't know who you are. But I, I, I planted 30 churches. I did this and I did this and this. Yeah, I didn't ask for your performance. He doesn't even get a thank you. All that's reported, ready? I don't know you. As we talk all the time about, do you know Jesus? That's not the key. The key is, does Jesus know you? That's the criterion. That's scary stuff. You with me? All the people, oh, he's surely going to get a great reward in him. Not guaranteed. I've said this oftentimes. Many of you know who Naomi Smoker is. Uh, Naomi was in the church for years, and she never married, and she served until her fingers were almost whittled down to nothing. And she, went to, she lived in Africa and uh, did so many wonderful things that we're still reaping the fruit from. And I thank God every day that my last name ends in an O and hers ends in an S because there could be nothing left when Naomi gets up there. She wore the same dress every day. 
She spent all her free time praying. This is, I'm, I'm being honest with you about this lady. She was amazing. She knew her Bible better than all of us. We were so embarrassed. <laughs> and she could read it in Swahili. So the Africans would sit with her, you know, and talk in Swahili, and she did more discipleship than anybody in the church. So I'm just glad that I gave an O, because I'll get up in line before she does, if it's alphabetical order. Because if you're after us, forget it. Naomi's getting it all. But those are, the, those are the people that should be highlighted in the kingdom, but the world doesn't pay any attention, do they? They're just not flashy enough. They're not pretty enough. They're not acceptable. Signs and wonders performed by disciple number two, it doesn't impress Jesus at all. I wrote down here, outward performance versus true relationship. Just knowing that Jesus and you are in union together you know, the song that Bob let us in, that should satisfy your life. You should be satisfied. <sighs> I feel full. Everything else is just a bonus. That's what it means is the Lord is my shepherd. What do I want? I don't have it. What do I want? I don't want anything. I've got Jesus. That was Paul and Silas. Go ahead and stick us in jail. Cut our heads off if you want to. It's Okay. We'll never be separated from Jesus, and that's, that's what counts for us. Okay. Someone posted on Facebook the other day, and I vowed to my children I won't respond, so I'm like, don't respond to anything, Dad, so they monitor me. <laughs> I can't say anything. One time I just put a question mark because I couldn't stand the bad theology they were shout, putting out there, and my son David jumped on it and said, not even question marks. <laughs> Someone posted, the greatest thing on earth is, is to be loved and to love back in return. <laughs> and I wanted to text back so quickly, no, the greatest thing on earth is to know Jesus and to be known by Jesus. Amen. No gooey feelings attached yet. The gooey can come if you want, but what's salient in a human Amen. life is that. And then it goes into eternity. Does Jesus know you? How about that asking a question in evangelism? Do you know Jesus? They'll fluff and bubble you to death. But does Jesus know you? What does that mean? It's a good question, isn't it? Uh, I was thinking about this. I have little Collins Ann Marie. She's two years old. No, just turned three in December. Collins Ann Marie. She's our youngest grandchild. Sarah's baby. Sarah and David Kennedy. And if I were to hold out a bowl of fresh fruit and hold her back over there by Russell City, and I've got fresh fruit, and you're over here, and you've got something that spins or sparkles or bounces or squeaks or put out a noise, when you turn Collins loose, do you think she'll come to me immediately with the fresh fruit? Where will she go? To the sparkly, shiny thing? That's what children do. Now, when I see 55-year-old people still going after those things, it busts my, it breaks me in pieces. Maturity says, I don't want the sparkly thing. Now, I'm, I'm a nutrition expert now because I had to take these classes. <laughs> and Bob has taught me. But the fruit is what's good for you, not this sparkly thing over here. Except Cracker Jacks. I haven't given those up. <laughs> All right. But uh, a lot of ministries, they shake that rattle, they do that f shiny thing, they scream, they shout, they go up and down the platform, and sure, people are going to respond. It's the Broadway. I've I think I've mentioned this before, and I will get off of it because I'm getting redundant when I do this. But I challenged somebody the other day. You actually probably know who he is. He's in another church now, and he leads worship. He was telling me about all the phenomenon that was happening in their meeting. And I said, um, do this next week. Dismiss all the musicians from off the stage. No music. No music. The only thing you're allowed is a microphone and a Bible. See what happens then. He looked at me. 
because they need a medium to try to get you to a place where you're responding. I'll stop because you're all frowning at me. Number four, two foundations, 24, 22 through 24. You know the story. Everybody knows the story. Did you realize it was couched in the Sermon on the Mount? Did you realize it's the ending illustration? Pretty pop, pretty incredible, isn't it? Now, sand in Palestine, of course, is very plentiful. But in order to get to rock, you've got to dig pretty deep through the sand. It's too hard. Again, building on the sand is an easy way. It's everywhere. Just level it out and start building something. Who cares? But if you want it to last, you've got to dig down through the sand until you hit rock and then use that as your mooring, as your foundation for building. We cannot build our lives and expect to stand through the storm and notice the storms do come in both instances. It's not like it, it didn't come to the guy with the good foundation. The storm still came. But the issue was one stood and one did not. We can't expect to stand when we build on convenience on the easy way. And so Jesus makes the contrast here between a true disciple who hears the word of God and does it, and he's considered wise and strong as rock. This is how he concludes the Sermon on the Mount. So what does this remind you of? It reminds you exactly of the test that God gave Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, where he says, I stand before you and I give you two choices, choose life or choose death. And then he said, gives the answer. He's like a professor who gives the answer. I used to love them. Said, choose life. Don't check this box. And that's what Deuteronomy says. It was a reminder, you got one or two ways to walk. Okay. But the casual or pretend disciple, hears the word of God, does not do it, and he is considered foolish and weak as sand. So let's end with Matthew 7, 28 and 29. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the... Crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Why is he contracted with the scribes here? The scribes only dictated what they heard the Pharisees or the rabbis saying. It was not original. And so they had no authority. They were just copyists. They were not original. Are you with me? They weren't receiving revelation on their own. They were using someone else's, copying it down and handing it out. And so they were no authority in what they were saying. But Jesus is recognized as having authority. I wrote down here, it's one thing to be impressed with his authority. It's another to grasp the significance of what he is saying. And it's still another thing to bow down to him as Lord. So you can be impressed with Jesus. You can even tell him that you really appreciate him and you like him. But you've got to take it all the way on the narrow road and say, thy will be done as you've spoken, as your word comes to me, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, but it flies in the face of, of what everybody's telling you to do. Everything. I'm going to do what the Lord tells me to do. And that is the difference between building on sand or building on rock. So I'll close this morning just with a simple question. Are you building on Christ the rock or are you building on the sand? It's a warning that comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount and we give him thanks. Let's all stand.